Yoshinobu Yamamoto and the other Dodgers pitchers got knocked around in the second and last game of the Soul Series. But unfortunately, that wasn't even the biggest story in anymore. Shohei Otani's translator, Ipe, uh, got fired, is being accused of stealing a lot of money. There's a big dark cloud hanging over that. We're going to dig into that. We're going to talk about the game. Lots to talk about. So let's get locked on Dodgers. You are Locked On Dodgers, your daily Los Angeles Dodgers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, Dodger fans, this is Locked On Dodgers, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks to our everydayers for making Locked On Dodgers your first listen every weekday morning. Remember, this show is free and available on all podcast platforms and on YouTube simply by searching for Locked On Dodgers. And please subscribe wherever you're watching and listening right now. My name is Jeff Snyder. That guy next to me is my co-host, Vince Samperio. Vince and I are both lifelong Dodger fans, just like a lot of you. We've also both spent time covering the Dodgers in the press box and the locker room. So we're not quite insiders, but we bring you the smart fans perspective on our boys in blue every weekday morning. And uh, Vince, unfortunately, uh, the the news today, the Dodgers did play a game. They lost. uh, So we don't even have a fun game to talk about after the the lousy news. I guess the game was fun if you didn't care who wins, maybe. uh, If you just like to see a lot of offense and bad defense. Um, But the biggest news in Dodger line right now is probably Ipe Mizuhara, uh, Shohei Otani's former interpreter now, uh, was fired on Wednesday, uh, I guess probably Thursday in Korea. Um, but uh, basically, he is being accused by Shohei Otani's attorneys of stealing millions of dollars from Otani to cover his gambling debts. There's there's so much to this, and we really the, the the frustrating part is we really don't know the truth about what happened because the stories were they changed a couple times. Originally, it was Otani loaning the money to Ipe uh, to cover the gambling debts, um, and then it became that Ipe stole the money. You know, I, I guess there's I, I can think of three realistic possibilities. One is that uh, it's exactly what they say right now, which is that Otani didn't know anything about it. Ipe stole the money to pay his gambling debts, which would require Ipe having significant access to Otani's bank accounts in the form of like being an authorized user. I assume that banks have pretty strict security protocols on wiring four and a half million dollars to bookies, uh, making sure that's the right person. Um, you know, so, but you know, it's not out of the realm of possibility that Ipe did, did have that kind of access the other two possibilities are uh, it's much worse than that. Like that Otani did pay off the, the, the bookie for Ipe or kind of the middle ground, which is kind of where I lean like the most likely option, which would be that Otani didn't know about it. Uh, Ipe did kind of, you know, finagle the payments one way or another. And then when reporters asked Otani's people about it, Otani thought, well, I don't want to embarrass my friend publicly. I'm going to cover for him publicly and deal with it privately. So, oh, yeah, I loaned him the money. And then it was like, wait, wait, how much was it? Oh, yeah, no, I didn't loan him four and a half million dollars. Uh, and, and so that's why the story changed. I don't know, Vince, like it, it's kind of crazy, right? Yeah, obviously there, there's a lot to unpack. I think four and a half million dollars was mentioned in the ESPN report of what the debt was. The actual wire transactions that have been reported were two. $500,000 transaction. So uh, not sure if, you know, if he still owes money or those other transactions haven't come up yet, whatever the case is. Uh, yeah. I, I, my initial thought in all this, and it is very much predicated on e just being uh, in over his head, a bad person, you know, whatever it is, is that he was just lying. Like, he is, so, so basically the, the breakdown of it was that, they found out it was found out, you know, reporters started asking them about it. So then they set up an uh, interview with ESPN on Tuesday night and where basically he told the story that Otani knew about it, that he, uh, you know, was helping them loan or was loaning him the money in order to help cover his gambling debts and, you know, all that type of stuff. And then came out, more people found out about it, started pressing it. It got to Otani's people, you know, this is all reports. So this is exactly what's in articles. Uh, got to Otani's people, the lawyers, the lawyers ended up, you know, 
contacting saying, hey, this is not, you know, don't run this story. This isn't true. They released their own statement saying that, you know, it was massive theft on, on eBay's part. And then, you know, eBay walked everything back to ESPN saying, Otani didn't know anything about it. This is all my fault. I'll take all the consequences, blah, blah. Obviously, when you lay it out that way, it, it looks, you know, suspicious uh, in the sense of, oh, well, Otani found out about it or Otani's people found out about it or found out what exactly what he said to ESPN. And then they, they're trying to, you know, make you pay the fall guy for whatever it is. I, you know, I don't I 100 percent don't believe to the extent that Otani's involved in the gambling at all. You know, I know there's a lot of people out there talking about all that. Um, you know, I can believe the fact that Otani was helping his friend with gambling debts. Uh, and I can believe, and this is more of what I believe is that Ipe was lying to ESPN about Otani knowing, uh, even with the fact knowing that this story is going to come out on ESPN. Like it, it's one of those where if he's a bad gambler, compulsive gambler, he might be a compulsive liar as well, you know, and, and like I said, four and a half million dollars, you're in over your head at that point. You, you know, you can do a lot of things that don't make a lot of sense to a lot of people. Yeah. There's definitely a lot of people who wanted to jump straight to Shohei Otani is going to be banned from baseball for life for gambling on baseball. I believe he bet on the 1986 Reds. Uh, you know, the, the, uh, there's definitely fans of a certain team that seem desperate for a scandal bigger than theirs. Uh, yeah, I won't name the team because I don't talk about them, but I did see a lot of their fans in my mentions uh, talking about their own scandal that has nothing to do with this. Uh, it's, yeah, it, it's Shohei Otani kept his entire free agency a secret, broke the news of his of his free agency on his own, kept his marriage a secret, a secret broke that news on his own. Is he really the kind of person who would make a wire transfer in his own name to a bookie? Like It just... Like it doesn't fit with anything that we know about Otani. Um, it, at least if he knew that it was illegal, like th that's another thing. There, gambling is legal, sports gambling is legal in a lot of places in this country. Um, and so it's not even necessarily a sure thing that Otani would have known that these were illegal gambling debts. It might have just been, Hey, I got in over my head gambling, can you help me? And you know, gambling. 50 years ago, that would have been, oh, it would, it would have been clear, oh, this is illegal gambling. But these days, it's legal. I mean, the irony is not lost on me that in about three minutes, I'm going to read a FanDuel ad, you know, like gambling, sports gambling is legal and it, it can be done responsibly. Uh, you know, obviously it's not always done responsibly. And if you do gamble, I hope you do it responsibly. Um, but there's no reason to assume that Otani knew that the debts were illegal and and then yeah, maybe he, if he did put the wire transfer in. And so maybe, you know, if we're going with the, if we accept the premise that Otani lied about something at some point, I would think it would be that, that, that it was when he realized, oh, these were illegal gambling debts that I paid off. Okay. I need to confer with my attorneys. And so the, you know, the, they're, they're figuring out their strategy right now. Uh, but even then, like that, that's, that's kind of the worst I can think of that Otani would have done in this. Yeah, it's mentioned in the ESPN article specifically, and it wasn't walked back, so I would assume this is still what is believed, is that Ipe said he didn't know that the game, like the bookie was legal. Well, so California, it's illegal in California, So, and it started in 2021. So, you know, Shohei's been in California for his entire baseball career. Now, when they travel to other states with gambling, now, you know, he, I think Fandle was mentioned or one of the gambling sites was mentioned as, you know, I used to gamble on there and then I, you know, had this guy. It feels like, you know, he probably has a guy that lives in, or this guy was from SoCal, but maybe that guy knows somebody that lives in another state and he's like putting in bets with him in order for him to put it down, you know, legally. And then it all kind of goes from there. But again, everything that we know is from what has been reported. And if you, just based on what we saw on social media, go read the articles and then just go off what's reported. That's literally all we know. And some of that stuff could be wrong because again, eBay walked back a lot of things that he said, and we don't necessarily know what's true. And to speak, you know, this is something I always get on to speak in such certainty on things that you have no, no idea about is always funny to me. Yeah. My number one goal in life is always to not form a conclusion on something I don't have very much information about. And that, is here true here. A lot of people got mad at me on Twitter for having the nerve 
to say that they might be telling the truth. Didn't say they are, said they might be. And, uh, and, and people like so many people are so certain of what happened. And, uh, so many people are so certain of opposite things somewhere. A lot of people are wrong about this and maybe everybody's wrong about this. We just don't know. And so that's, what's going on as of right now. I'm sure there will be more coming out. Maybe tomorrow's episode, maybe next week we'll be hearing more about this, but luckily in a minute, we're going to talk about actual well, baseball. One point real oh, quick yeah. is that as of now, there's no MLB investigation into anything for Otani. Uh, that could obviously always change, but as of now, there's no, MLB is not involved at all right now. Yeah, Fabian Ardai of The Athletic reported that during the game that we're about to talk about that unfortunately was bad. It was bad for Yoshinobu Yamamoto. It was bad for all the relief pitchers. Good for the offense, but not quite good enough. We'll dig into that. So thanks for making us your first listen, and please keep it locked on, Dodgers. This episode is brought to you by Amazon Fire TV. Fire TV is your destination for sports from live games to highlights to in-depth analysis. Fire TV offers amazing viewing experiences with smart TVs as well as the Fire TV stick that you can plug into your existing TV. In fact, you can even plug it in if your car has an HDMI port like you can see on the screen if you're watching on YouTube. That's a picture that my son took from the backseat of our Suburban the other day while we were driving to Arizona. I'm driving like a good studious dad. I uh, My hands aren't at 10 and 12 or... 10 and what is 10 and two. Uh, anyway, I think I have one hand on the wheel somewhere, but you can't see it. But in the back seat, you can see my boys are watching stranger things on their fire TV stick. It's awesome. And, uh, you can catch all your sports, whether it's opening week at a baseball, college basketball tournament, you're going to want to have a fire TV and fire TV recently created fire TV channels to deliver a constant supply of the latest videos from your favorite sports brands, all for free. That includes all of us at locked on and most of the big pro leagues and college conferences as well. Fire TV channels let you dive into all the game analysis, highlights, and more to keep up to date on all the latest in the world of sports, March Madness, NBA, MLB, and lots more. Not to mention great news, entertainment, gaming, travel, and cooking channels as well. Check out Fire TV channels on Fire TV and Alexa devices. If you haven't checked out Fire TV channels, you should. Trust me on this. To learn more, visit Amazon.com slash TV. This episode is also brought to you by FanDuel. Say goodbye to busted brackets because FanDuel lets you bet on every game of the tourney. Whether you're betting on a big upset or one seed, it's time to go dancing on America's number one sports book. And right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets if your first $5 bet wins. As we are recording this Thursday morning, the NCAA tournament is about to start, probably uh, within minutes, I would guess. So, uh, you know, if you're not a FanDuel customer, become one and boom. Make a bet, just bet on a one seed to beat a 16 seed. When they do, get $200 in bonus bets. It's 200 bucks to use on point spreads, money lines. You can even pick who's going to win it all. Just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and bet on college hoops until they cut down the nets. Hey, we're back. We want to thank you for making Locked On Dodgers your first listen every weekday morning. Uh, especially want to thank our everydayers, those of you who are with us every day. I mean, I talk to you everydayers in just a second about some new stuff that's going on. Uh, but you can become an everydayer if you're not one just by watching and listening every weekday morning. You can also become a Locked On Dodgers insider by going to joinsubtext.com slash Locked On Dodgers. It's a text message based service. We text you our thoughts on stuff. There's, there's been a lot going on with all this EPA news and, and other things. So it's a lot of fun. You can text back and forth with us one on one conversations. Check it out. It's just a few bucks a month with a free 14 day trial. Join subtext.com slash locked on Dodgers. And be sure to check out Locked On Sports Today and Locked On Sports Los Angeles, the two 24 7 streaming channels from uh, the Locked On Podcast Network over on YouTube. Locked On Sports Los Angeles will have a new thing called postcasts after almost every Dodger game, uh, our buddy Pete Fox will be on there live on the locked on sports LA channel, uh, talking about the game and it's called the locked on Dodgers postcast In that, that, podcast the postcast will also show up in our podcast feed so if you do listen on the podcast you will notice that there will be more episodes showing up they will be clearly labeled postcast those ones will most of the time be hosted by pete fox although sometimes vince or i may be his guest on them uh but just want to let you know those will be showing up our goal here is to give you as much dodgers content as you could possibly want and then you choose, you know, which ones you want. I, I encourage you to give it a shot. See what you like. Pete has a different voice than we do, a different perspective on the Dodgers. And you might really enjoy that. And so be sure to check that out. And then, you know, and then you can pick and choose in your podcast app which ones you listen to, you know, and just listen to us every day. And, you know, but give Pete a shot at least. And uh, 
I yeah. feel like today is the perfect day for having a postcast and a regular podcast because if you just care about the game, Pete's got you covered with the postcast, but we have to talk about a little, the eBay situation, which you know he probably didn't have to talk about. Yeah, although I'm not sure. I think Pete said he wasn't doing well for this game. Uh, he's got, but he, he said about 140 of the 162 games this year. Um, but he also does the postcast for the Clippers and the Chargers and and I think UCLA sports. And so there's going to be uh, sometimes where he doesn't get to the Dodgers, but most games. Uh, but this game, if Pete was doing one, he would be talking about Yoshinobu Yamamoto, who had a really, really, really bad day. Um, he pitched one inning, allowed five earned runs. Uh, that's a 45 career ERA at this point in his career. The very first pitch he threw was right down the middle to Xander Bogarts. Bogarts smoked it up the middle. And it seemed to me, I, I'm not a pitching coach. I'm not a psychologist. I am. I don't play either of those things on TV. I'm just a lowly podcaster. But it seemed like, you know, Bogarts probably got the scouting report from the Mariners game that Yamamoto pitched in spring training. Uh, said he's around the zone. He likes to throw first pitch strikes, jump on it. And maybe Yamamoto got spooked a little bit by that one and, and maybe tried to be too fine after that because – uh, he, it seemed like he was trying to avoid the middle of the plate and ended up avoiding the plate altogether too often. Yeah. I, I mean, that is very much possible. The fact that almost every other pitcher that took the mound had some kind of issue in this game. And even in yesterday's game, I mean, no, only one starter got to the fifth inning. That was glass. Now, Nobody, you know, the Padres starters didn't make it out of the fourth inning, either of them. Uh, so, you know, there, I feel like maybe the mound first game, everything kind of added up. But yeah, for him, it, it snowballed. And, you know, we, we got a lot of questions about people being concerned about Yamamoto last week. And we said we'd address it. And then at that, after a certain point, I was like, well, we'll just wait till the first game. And uh, now the first game happened. And, and those same concerns, I would imagine, are there for people. And you know, rightfully so now. This is a game that mattered. So, you know, we can't you sit back and say, oh, there's no concerns at all. I don't think there's any long-term concerns at the moment. I think there is some short-term concerns in, in the sense of Yamamoto figuring it out, whether, you know, getting used to the baseball, getting used to the mound, getting used to MLB, getting used to, you know, whatever. But, you know, he mentioned having some, some issues with command. He mentioned having some issues pitching out of the stretch, which is, Pitching out of the stretch is an issue we had seen him have in, in, in spring. So there's a lot of different things. But, yeah, you look at the pitch chart, um, Pitching Ninja put it out yesterday of where Yamoto was, and you could see why the Padres hit him hard. When he was in the zone, he was right down the middle, a little low in the zone. And when he didn't do that, he was out of the zone completely. Like there was no really in between, uh, you know, wasn't really on the corners of the plates at all or anything like that. And, you know, we kind of mentioned before where, Yamoto kind of got beat by, you know, his BABIP was over 500 in spring and and stuff like that. But the Padres did hit the ball hard this game. You know, he was leaving the ball over the plate. And like I said, I think short-term concerns, yes, he's going to have to make some adjustments. Long-term concerns, I don't think there's too much right now. Yeah, and it would have been really fun if he had just come in and dominated immediately. Um, that That doesn't happen very often. Like even I, I tweeted this out, even Hideo Nomo, he had a very good first start uh, of his career. And then he allowed seven runs in his second start. Uh, and he ended up with four games that rookie season, that elite rookie season, he won rookie of the year. He had four games in which he allowed five or more runs. Um, you know, I just popped up that, that spray chart you were talking about, Vince. Uh, you can see Yamamoto was all over the place, but you know, most pitchers when they, debut in the big leagues, whether it is as a 22 year old out of triple a or a 25 year old out of Japan, um, are going to have some growing pains that. So I guess I expected growing pains. I didn't expect five runs in one inning and not to get into the second inning. It was, it was worse than I expected. Um, but the stuff still looks good. You know, it, the command obviously wasn't there. Um, and, but for some reason, because command is kind of what he's known for, I'm less worried about that. Like, uh, it, it doesn't seem likely that he just lost his greatest tool overnight. I used to be great at command and now I'm terrible at it. Uh, at least not permanently. And so the fact that the stuff still looked pretty good, the, the change up still has the good movement, all that stuff. He just didn't kind of, he didn't get into accounts to be able to 
use the pitches off each other like he wanted to and everything. Um, but all in all, like, yeah, it, it sucked, but I, I expect him to pitch pretty well against the Cardinals next week. Um, you know, I think we need to temper our expectations. And part of the good thing about a 12 year contract is, uh, this is one of, you know, 350 starts he's going to make hopefully. Uh, but yeah, it, it would have been nice to have a much better one to start this career. Yeah, definitely. You know, there was one ground ball that it might have, it probably was fair, but it was very much close to him. Max Muncy could have bent over a little bit more and got the stop, and yeah, that would have prevented. I think that was three runs at the time. Um, you know, that would have got him an extra out, maybe, you know, held it to three, maybe hit, let him go and pitch a second inning. But I think the, the other part too is the splitter. He didn't really throw it in spring. They talked about it on the broadcast because he knows that's his, you know, pitch that his out pitch and, and everything else. And uh, I, I was either on the broadcast or in the post game, they talked about the different baseball and how the splitter, you know, the splitter is popular in Japan because the baseball in Japan allows you to, you know, more easily throw that splitter. Uh, so he wasn't throwing it here. Uh, they mentioned on the broadcast that he didn't really throw inside during spring. So he didn't really have, you know, that cut command inside. He, he had the hit by pitch, uh, you know, second batter of the game. I think Tatis, he, he hit him. So, yeah, there was a lot of things that, and we talked about this in spring where he was trying things out and he was trying things out in spring. Uh, and then now he had to try different things out. So that, like I said, it, it's, it'll, he's not going to go win any next game. I can get, I'll guarantee that. Uh, and you know, his 45 ERA can only really go down from here. Vince will eat his shoe. <laughs> um, yeah. And, and it's, uh, what was I going to say about that? Something you were just saying. It totally. Oh, there was a good article from Kylie McDaniel on ESPN talking. And this was before the game, obviously, but talking about uh, he looked at Yamamoto's entire spring and he made that point that Yamamoto, did, Yamamoto didn't use his change up much because it's already a, a tool that he knows he has. And so it might take a little. I'm sure he was throwing in the bullpen sessions and stuff, though. Um, but yeah, it was it was not a fun game. Uh, you know, he he. Eric Steven joked early in the game that Yoshinobu Yamamoto is ready for the 2023 NLDS. Um, but the crazy part is if the offense that showed up today had shown up in the NLDS, the Dodgers would have swept the D backs because Dodgers put up 11 runs. You know, they, the offense hit really well, uh, you know, still left a lot of guys on base, but you know, also drove in a lot of guys. So uh, we're going to come back in a minute. We're going to talk about the, the way the game played out, the way it was managed, all that stuff. And just the differences between, even though these games count, between a game now and a game later in the season or in the postseason. So thanks again for making Locked On Dodgers your first listen. And please keep it Locked On Dodgers. This episode is brought to you by Prize Picks. Football season season may be over, but the action on the floor is heating up. Whether it's tournament season or the fight for playoff home court, there's no shortage of high stakes basketball moments this time of year. Get in on the excitement with Prize Picks, America's number one fantasy sports app, where you can turn your hoops knowledge into serious cash. You can now win up to 100 times your money on Prize Picks with as little as four correct picks. You can turn $10 into $1,000 with NBA, NHL, and college basketball entries today on Prize Picks, America's number one fantasy sports app. Uh, you can, Prize Picks is the best way to get in on the action on sports in more than 30 states across the country, including California, Texas, and Georgia. Uh, Vince and I were talking before we hit record that Vince uh, lost a few bucks on Yoshinobu Yamamoto on Thursday because uh, the he picked more on four and a half strikeouts and Yamamoto only had two. Uh, so, you know, maybe Shohei Otani can loan him some money to cover that. Um, but it's a, it's a fun way to play daily fantasy sports. So just go to download the price picks app today and use code locked on MLB all lowercase for a first deposit match up to a hundred dollars. That's the price picks app code locked on MLB for a first deposit match up to a hundred dollars. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. Hey, we're back. Thanks again for making Locked On Dodgers your first listen. Thanks again to our everydayers. Remember to become an everydayer by watching and listening every weekday morning and make that easier by subscribing wherever you're watching or listening right now. If you are watching on YouTube, we'd love to hear your thoughts in the YouTube comments section. If you listen on the podcast, we'd love to hear from you through all the different contact info we will give you at the end. You can also, if you're a Locked On Dodgers insider, just text us and you can become a Locked On Dodgers insider by going to joinsubtext.com slash Locked On Dodgers. And be sure to check out Locked On Sports Today and Locked On Sports Los Angeles, the 24-7 streaming channels over on YouTube from the Locked On Podcast Network. 
And Vince, this game, like, uh, it got out of hand early and then it got back in hand and got back out of hand and, you know, it was back and forth. The Dodgers never led. They did pull within one late in the game. Um, but being down five to nothing before you even bat it, I, I think the game played out from a managerial standpoint a little bit differently. And, and there was the fact that, you know, the, the Dodgers played a close game the day before. And so Evan Phillips had pitched, you know, they kind of used their, their A team on the relievers uh, in, in the game, in the first game of the series. And while I'm sure some of those guys would have been available, it, you don't necessarily use that A team when you are down by five runs or it's seven runs as it was later down nine to two, uh, you know, and, and then, you know, in hindsight, it's like, well, if they had known they were going to score 11 runs, they probably would have done everything they could have done to hold the Padres at five runs after that first inning. Whether that, you know, I, I think they took Yamamoto out more because of the pitch count in that first inning than anything else. I think it was just, it was a high stress inning. He probably could have gotten another inning or two for overall pitch count and everything, but it was like, well, what's the point? Uh, you know, so maybe he could have come in, pitched a little bit better. Uh, we, we saw... You know, Michael Grove and Kyle Hurt both pitched well in their first innings of relief and then less well in their second innings. Uh, J.P. Fireisen ended up being the, the last pitcher uh, and didn't pitch, you know, obviously gave up the 3 one homer to Manny Machado that kind of put the game out of the reach in the ninth inning. Um, it, all in all, though, it's like I don't know how much we can actually learn about how an important late season game would play out from watching this game. Yeah, we didn't learn anything about how the Dodgers would be managed in a game that not, – not that this game doesn't matter, but that is different. You know, this is the first two games of the season. They're playing a week before they would have normally played. Guys aren't ready to go back-to-back. -back. You know, in if this game had happened later in the year and, and where everyone's already in, you know, midseason form, you would have seen Evan Phillips at some point. You would have seen – uh, maybe Joe Kelly at some point. You would have seen Brazier. You would have everyone. You, Daniel Hudson. You would have seen all four of them at some point in this game, especially after it was nine to two. The Dodgers cut it to what nine to nine to four, nine to five, nine to seven, or nine to six. Uh, you know, then the Padres will attack on some runs, and then the Dodgers will get it back, and then you know, ultimately twelve eleven, a twelve eleven game uh, in you know even in June or July is not going to see JP Fire Eyes in pitching that that top of the or that top of the ninth it would have seen somebody uh you know like I said phillips kelly brazier you know gratterall if he's when he's healthy all that type of stuff so the the part that we you know kind of could learn from this is you know going that second inning it, you needed the length at that point so michael grove was going to go multiple innings kind of regardless of what really happened unless the dodgers had put up a bunch of runs in that second inning and then uh, you know, Grove, now it's like a, you know, a, a different game. So there's lots to go into for Grove. You know, is this what he is? Is he going to be a one inning reliever? Can he be a multi inning reliever? That's remains to be seen. We're going to keep seeing that, you know, play out. Kyle Hurt is probably not going to be on the opening day roster when we get back, but if he is, can he be, you know, more than a one inning guy? We don't know that. Um, I'm surprised we didn't see Landon Knack. Maybe he was like a emergency guy in case they did go to extra innings at some point. Uh, because I would have liked to have seen him rather than, you know, Alex Vesio was going to pitch in this game. I didn't necessarily, you know, maybe want that to happen just based on the Dodgers were close enough to, hey, if we hold these guys, I think the Dodgers are going to score enough runs because the Padres aren't going to use all their guys back to back either. I think they only end up using one of their relievers uh, in both games, Cosgrove, the lefty. So, yeah, it, it, it was frustrating. It was annoying. And the fact that the offense got it to within three, within two, within one also makes this more annoying but you know knowing the fact that if this game was later in the season when guys can go back to back or or you know or, or more ready to go uh the dodgers might have pulled this one off yeah uh cosgrove and matsui both pitched oh, matsui, yeah. yeah um both lefties um yeah it, the the offense looked really good and and that's promising um and, and again like we said earlier it's they, it wasn't great they did leave the bases loaded uh, in the first inning, um, it, they didn't get the bases loaded till there was two outs. So it, it's, you know, it's harder to get them in at that point. Um, but you know, they, every run matters and, you know, they scored 11, but I think they left 12 guys on base. Uh, and so that's, that's a lot of opportunities they didn't cash in, but I, I would, uh, venture a bet that if the Dodgers scored 11 runs every game this year, they would finish with about 145 wins. 
you know, and uh, that would be a record. Uh, 11 runs a game would be a record too. So it did show a lot. Like there, if the pitching had been better, this would have been a really fun game to talk about because the offense kind of showed, you know, Mookie Betts looked awesome. And, and one of the nice things we talked about uh, before we started recording, because there's no game uh, today, tonight uh we do have tomorrow's episode to basically talk about more about this game so we'll get into more of the specifics about Mookie Betts and Max Muncy's defense and and stuff like that uh, on tomorrow's episode but all in all I mean it was a fun game to watch from an offensive standpoint they only had one one two three inning and that was the bottom of the ninth inning uh the rest they had runners on in fact I believe that was the only inning in the two games out yeah. of the 18 that the Dodgers didn't have a single base runner was the bottom of the ninth inning of this game. Like the offense did some fun things the last couple of days that kind of uh, foreshadows what will hopefully be a fun season. Yeah. It's funny to have your offense score 11 runs and you still be frustrated with the offense. Like those first four innings they had in the first inning, that second and third one out ended up being base loaded. They don't get a run in the fourth inning. I believe that second and third one out don't get a run home. You know, little things like that. And, and you know, Otani comes up when it's 12-11. Mookie just had the big hit to, to pull it within one. And then Otani swings at the first pitch and, and grounds out. And Otani had a couple balls that would have been home runs in, in a few parks as well. You know, the ballpark held some in. So, yeah, offensively, if you watch just half of this game, the bottom half of the game, it was very fun. If you watch the top half of the game, not as fun. Yeah, watch it with a piece of paper taped over the bottom right corner of your TV so you can't see the see the score yeah. and maybe hit mute because they might have mentioned the score a time or two there. But yeah, just watch the bottoms of the innings and and you'll kind of get a feel for what the offense at Dodger Stadium might look like this year. And, and that's that without could, Freddie Freeman doing much at all. He only had one hit and that was nobody yeah. on. Although I think his on-base percentage this season is close to 500 because yeah, he has the one hit. He also has four walks and a hit by pitch in the two games. So he's been on base six times in two games. Uh, yeah, but yeah, the then, batting uh, average is low. Yeah, Chad Moriyama had a pretty perfect tweet going. Max Muncy has the most disappointing 1,000 OPS to start the season because anytime Max Muncy has had runners in scoring position, he has not come through. Anytime he's had runners on base or solo, he has come through. So. Yeah, and, and you guys know if you're an everyday, you know my feeling on that. That you know, I, I I don't believe that Max Muncy is a better hitter without guys on base. I think he has been a better hitter these two games without runners on base. But I'll take the thousand OPS and trust the, the to even out over the course of the season. Uh, and you know, ho hopefully it will. Uh, Teoscar Hernandez probably won't look at strike three with you know, a runner on third and less than two outs, you know, hopefully it was kind of funny for a guy who kind of the coming in, the concern was that he was too much of a free swinger. And then he strikes out looking at and complains about a pitch that, that's a good call uh, with a runner on third and less than two outs. He had to have been expecting the off speed. And then he was like, okay, I'm not going to swing. I'm not going to swing. And then he gets a fastball in the outer half and doesn't swing. Yeah. So, you know, it, it's hitting a baseball is hard. Uh, and, and pitching a baseball is hard too, for that matter. You know, we, somebody was, uh, talking to me on Twitter, like, why would JP Fire Eisen throw that pitch in that spot to Manny Machado? It's like, I don't think he meant to. Like, that wasn't that, in the game plan. All I right, think change up uh, chest high was. If was Machado awful. comes up with two guys on, let's throw it right in his wheelhouse, really slow, and and just see how far he can hit it. You know, it, things happen. You know, pitches and even great pitchers don't always hit their spots. So you know, unfortunately, sometimes guys don't hit their spots, and great hitters make them pay. Um, but I think that'll do it for today. Uh, like I said, we have tomorrow's episode two to talk more about this game. We will dig into Mookie's great day and Muncie's lousy day on defense and uh, and whatever else uh, comes up. Maybe there's more Ipe news, maybe not. But there's plenty to talk about from this game and looking forward to the freeway series. We get to do more spring training now. You got anything else for today, Vince? No. Uh, I'm glad this baseball is back, though. We get so much to talk about. For sure. Hopefully not uh, the first part of the segment, but everything else. Yeah, yeah, the baseball part. It's always fun. To, even losses are fun to talk about because it means we've got to watch a baseball game. So that'll do it for us. Thank you all for making Locked on Dodgers your first listen. Thanks especially to our everydayers. Please become an everydayer by watching or listening every weekday morning. Uh, you can follow us on – oh, yeah, check out the Locked on Sports Today and Locked on Sports Los Angeles over on YouTube, two 24-7 streaming channels from the Lockdown Podcast Network. Become a Lockdown Dodgers insider by going to joinsubtext.com slash Lockdown Dodgers. You can follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok at Lockdown Dodgers. Vince is on Twitter at Vince since 91. I am on Twitter at Snydog. 
Uh, you can also email us, LockedOnDodgers at gmail.com, or send us a voicemail or a text message to 323-863-LOCK-5625. We are here every weekday morning. We hope you'll be here with us. When you get in your car or sit on your couch, tell your smart device to play podcast Locked On Dodgers. And remember, you don't have to agree. You just have to listen. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Have a good one.